Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. I mean, we have nothing to talk about. What a shame. (laughs) So, look, this is a big deal. $11 billion. It does feel a very Apollo-appropriate deal, but it is something a little bit different than what you usually do, perhaps in size and the type and industry it's in. So how hard was this deal to do? What did it take to get it over the line? Sure. Well, uh, look, I think you're uh, seeing, if you take a step back, companies all over the world are facing unprecedented levels of CapEx, right? Digitization, deglobalization, energy transition. And they're starting to think more creatively about how are they going to fund this? How are they going to fund this capital? And private capital is going to play uh, an increasingly important part of that. Um, You know, the Apollo platform, $700 billion, equity, credit, hybrid, you know, lots of different creative structures, and the ability to scale it. You know, these type of blue chip, large cap companies, they're not talking about 100 million or 500 million. They're, They're talking 2 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion plus. And so the ability to really come up with those creative solutions in scale is really, really critical. But I think you're going to see more and more of this uh, coming because for, absolutely more from Apollo, <laughs> but but in general, just the need for this type of capital is insatiable. Right. It's really I mean, insatiable. we saw in the earnings report, right, all these tech giants having an insane amount of CapEx to try to get their AI capacity up. Intel, obviously, is one of them. They did, though, say that their manufacturing won't be profitable about 20, until 2027. So how much of this also is not just Apollo backing AI, but Apollo backing Intel for the long term. Absolutely. This is all about partner selection, structuring. Every situation is going to be different. That's the beauty of private capital. It doesn't have to fit one single box. You can really be creative to meet the needs of the project, the needs of the counterparty. Uh, and, and this is just a great example of, of how you're going to see more and yeah. more of this. Yeah. Well, if you're going to see more of it, I mean, does Intel need more? They're trying to take a crack at NVIDIA. That is, that is no easy feat. Right. Well, I think Intel's announced over $150 billion of projects. So uh, that's just one of, I think, many companies across lots of different industries that really need this type of capital. Are you talking to other companies, too, besides Intel for this type of thing? Well, no comment, <laughs> but uh, you can probably assume. Can well, probably just the last assume. thing on this, Scott, because, I mean, we are here in Europe. This is a Europe deal. It's a, it's a plant in Ireland, and Europe has been behind on manufacturing. Is there some way that this is almost a test tube, that it's a test trial, and if this works, maybe you do more in Europe like this? Well, I think just zo- zooming out a little bit, I-, I do think you touch on an important point, which is uh, if you compare the growth rates in Europe versus the growth rates in the U.S., obviously it's, it's undeniable what's happening. A big part of that is co- companies' access to capital. Right In the U.S., in addition to the banking system, you have a re- very robust capital market, a securitization market, a very deep private capital market. In Europe, all of those things either don't exist or are very, very small, very fragmented, very nascent. And I think you need to see more and more of this, and you will start to see private capital play a bigger role here in Europe. It's, uh, yeah. it's a tougher environment, though, because there does feel to be more regulation here. So how does that impact your global allocation, that there's opportunities here, but they're a little bit harder to execute? Well, it just makes it more complicated, uh, but you're seeing it. I, I think uh, European leaders are starting to recognize that Europe is choked for capital, that that is limiting the amount of growth, that Europe is falling behind, and it needs this type of capital. It needs to encourage private capital. It needs to encourage securitization in order to make that happen. And, you know, I know Europe's been talking about it for a while, but, you know, hopefully this is a bit of the wake-up call it needs to get going. There's also a rate divergence story happening in about 24 hours, about 300 miles from here in Frankfurt. We'll get what presumably will be the first cut of this cycle from the ECB. Does that make a difference to you at all, that maybe there's easier policy here? Uh, No, I think that's more indicative of the, the need, the economy needs to get boosted by... I'd say artificial lowering of rates uh, as opposed to the U.S. where we've been saying for some time the economy is so strong, rate cuts probably don't make sense yet. Right. Do you think that there are some people in the U.S. then that just have been doing the extend and pretend that they bought deals at high valuations and have just been hoping for a rate cut? So what happens if we don't get one this year and maybe only a few next year? Oh, I think that's absolutely right. I think the reality of this, and I think what, you know, it's the morning of of the conference here, but I think you're going to see a lot of uh, GPs and LPs coming to the recognition that it's going to be a pretty dry spell for the next few years vis-a-vis the old portfolio uh, of of private equity companies. It's going to take longer to monetize the valuation gap between where folks loaded up on deals versus where the market is today is just, there's a big gap, and uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, a little bit tougher for private equity firms to, to 
see the type of returns that they were looking for versus years past. What, is, what does that actually look like? What, or what causes that dam to break? And then what does it look like when it does? Yeah, I don't know that it's so much a dam. Hmm. I think the reality is private equity loaded up at the top of the market uh, using very inexpensive debt. Uh, valuation environment has fundamentally changed. And as a result, uh, private equity sponsors are just going to have to hold companies longer, have to grow into those capital structures, are going to need to take on equity to get some refinancings done. And all that means, it's just math, that returns are going to be lower over the next few years. Well, I'm sure LPs, investors who hear the idea that they need to hold on for companies longer are not going to be happy with that. They've been clamoring to get their cash back. So how do they do both at the same time? Uh, they generally don't. Uh, they generally don't. Uh, I think you're going to see sponsors looking for creative ways to return capital, whether that's through uh, structured equity investments or other things into these portfolio companies. But eventually, sponsors are just going to have to accept the valuation environment is lower and start selling companies. So are you getting ready to buy some deals? Are you getting absolutely, ready? Absolutely. Are you hiring to match that? No, we have a pretty robust, we have, you know, several hundred people already here in, right. in, in Europe and uh, feel like we have a good footprint. Yeah. Okay, so you're ready, you're ready for the deals of what they come. Absolutely. What, what kind of valuation discounts do you think we're talking? How hefty could they get? Well, I don't think it's so much discounts as okay. it is the current environment is just, you know, repriced. Uh, you, you know, folks, you, you know, that, that, that you know, when, when deals are purchased at a 0% rate, that implied a valuation environment of X at a 5% rate. Uh, you know, risk-free rate, you know, that valuation environment is lower. And whether marks reflect that or not, mm. TBD, but the reality is it's coming. And, you know, one of the venues for exiting historically is pretty much closed. It's been iced over. That is IPOs. Unless you have maybe a really robust tech company that you can IPO, it's a really hard environment. But it's kind of counterintuitive because stocks are at an all-time high. You'd think that the IPO market would be back. So if it's not back now, has something fundamentally changed? Absolutely. Danny, I think you're really onto something here. The, 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 the equity markets have fundamentally changed, right? It, because of the massive increase in indexation in passive uh, market participants, Right, the market doesn't care about a three billion dollar IPO, a five billion dollar IPO, uh, and that's forcing sponsors to also think about, well, how do you exit? Right, because uh, unless you're prepared to to just exit at a mediocre valuation in the equity markets, you're going to need a different path, a different path to exit. And I think that trend is only continuing. I mean, look at the the U.S. equity market. Ten stocks represent a third of the S and P, probably two thirds of the gain over the last year. Right, that's just indexation at work. It's just uh, more and more dollars flowing into the biggest stocks, uh, and that's tough. That's tough for, for small yeah. companies. You sound a little bit like David Einhorn. He's also said that fundamental companies can't get a break because of just the price insensitive buyers. So what is the good option? You say other ways to exit, other ways for liquidity. Take me out, you know, five, ten years from now, where the IPO market, we've decided that this is no longer an option except for a few slim companies. What are people doing instead? Sure. But by, by the way, I'll, I'll answer that in a second. But But it's that very disconnect that actually makes uh, public to private is very interesting right now. Yes, yes the S&P looks like it's hitting all-time highs, but you have a third of the companies in the S&P whose stock is down year-to-date, right? That's just not reported on. That's not what people fundamentally know, uh, but there's a lot of interesting companies at reasonable valuations out there. To answer your, your, your question, though, where do, where do you go with this? Uh, you know, this is all the more reason why purchase price matters, right? If you buy companies at reasonable valuations, you're not beholden to premium valuations on an IPO in order to make your returns, right? You, you can still go public, you just may not get that super premium valuation you thought. Or, you know, you're selling to a strategic, you're selling to another sponsor, you're recapping. There's lots of ways to do it, but it can't be dependent on, well, I'm just going to get out at a, at a premium perfect valuation.